Welcome everyone. Today we'll go through aortic regurgitation in the critically unwell. Um, for those of you that haven't met, I'm Emma Bocock. I'm one of the intensive care consultants and echo reporting doctors. Um, and we'll get started. So aortic regurg. Um, so caring is share sharing is caring, as they say. And Chris uh, helped me out with this presentation, which is a little bit last minute, and he's shared his slides, which I've uh, edited a little bit and added more cases to have some fun at the end. Um, so why is intensivists or you know ED physicians, et cetera, care about aortic regurgitation? I think we all in, in this group care about aortic regurgitation because most of us, it's going to come up in the exam for sure, whether that's in the written or the viva, you'll definitely, it's one of Sam's favourite things as well, so it'll definitely come up. I guess that's number one, <laughs> there's number one. Um, but also, it really, obviously, it matters for our patients. Often these pa they can catch you by surprise. I think the ones with severe AR, you know, they're, they often are chronic AR and then decompensate when they come to the ICU for a whole myriad of reasons. And a lot of what we normally do, so our usual, you know, treatments, noradrenaline, things that increase afterload will will worsen, obviously worsen the regurgitant fraction and worsen the AR and worsen shock, etc. So they often present or they can present with cardiogenic shock and congestion. Um, and then, of course, the acute aortic regurgis, they very much can catch you by surprise and they're really often surgical emergencies and acute aortic regurg is a whole different ball game to chronic aortic regurg which we'll talk through um, and often needs very different management generally it tends to be things like infective endocarditis or dissection um, that are going to give you horrific um, acute AR and it also has implications obviously for decision making around surgical referral, but also about when we are putting in or well, I guess what choice of, of inotropy or vasopressor to start, but also when we're putting in mechanical support devices and we'll all have probably different ones where we work. But, you know, it's important for us here at Nepi and we probably use a, a bit more of balloon pumps, I think, than other places. And um, obviously it has big implications for when we're sort of making decisions on that as well. So it is really important to us um, as critical care physicians. So I'm going to go through anatomy and mechanism. I'm going to spend a bit of time on this because I think it's often overlooked and it's just super important um, to understand the anatomy. And, or, you know, of course, the mechanism is everything because you're going to manage someone with an aortic root problem, very different to how you're going to manage someone with a leaflet problem. Um, and whether you've got, you know, sort of um, an acute surgical pathology, that's obviously going to be important for acute treatment decisions. So how do we assess the severity of AR? I'm going to talk you through that in a pretty systematic way, thanks to Chris's nice slides. Um, and we'll go through the different sort of pitfalls with each of these. You will need to know all of this actually for your exam. Um, or hopefully there won't be too much, um, you know, extraneous stuff that you don't need to know. Everything that hopefully I tell you, you will um, it'll come up in your exam, so it'll be useful. It's also obviously useful in your clinical practice. And as I said, you know, acute and chronic AR, very different pathologies. And so we'll talk through a little bit about that and then finish off with some cases. So the aortic valve is, as we know, it's, it's tri-leaflet. Um, it's very thin. And the normal area for your aortic valve orifice is between three and four centimetres squared. You can see if I pause this, I pause this and scroll back through when it's open in systole, it has this triangular shape. And that's really important just to train your eye to as well, because sometimes you'll look at these valves and think that's not triangular. That looks elliptical to me. And you'll be thinking, could this be a bicuspid valve? So important to know the normal before you can spot abnormal. Obviously, there's three comma shoes. The way that we this is a does anyone know what image this is? It's zoomed in, but where's what's this taken with? It's a toe image. Yes, aortic valve short axis, isn't it, with toe at 50 degrees? So we've got the intraatrial septum here, and next to the septum always lives the non-coronary cusp. So Chris says something like the non-coronary cusp sits on the fence, which I actually think is quite nice. Um, so if you always just anchor yourself on that one first, and then the right coronary cusp is always next to the right-sided structures. So here's your outflow tract here, tricuspid valves just here, and this is our left um, coronary cusp. And left and right are named that way because the coronary ostia come off for the corresponding coronary arteries. 
So important to obviously be familiar with normal anatomy. And again, in transthoracic, we get pretty good views of the aorta most of the time. Um, so it's this cusp, this is parasternal long axis, this cusp here, you probably can't see because I always do this and realize you can never quite see what I'm doing. Um, this cusp here is your, what? what's this, Rob? This one that I've got my the laser on. You're muted actually, Rob. Sorry. I think that should be your right. Very nice. And how about this one? I can't tell you. <laughs> no, it yeah. should be none or the left. Yeah, very nice. And, and that's it. You can't tell because it depends on how you're fanning through the, the valve. Um, Umi, where have I got my laser pointer here? The non -coron non coronary cast. Yeah, very nice. And right and left. And again, you can see that sort of triangular opening, nice thin valve, you know, opening very well. Um, and this is zoomed in, which we should always do, of course, when we're looking at the aorta again, right and either non or left. Um, and again, just a zoomed in, a zoomed in view there uh, of that one. And let me just get rid of this laser pointer, put this down. Um, so they're labelled, I think. Hopefully you'll all be familiar with that, um, but yeah, important to know the normal anatomy. Equally as important is your understanding of the aortic root. Obviously your cusps are intricately linked to the aortic root. The bases of the cusps are inserted at the aortic annulus, and then we have our sinus of Valsalva, and then the proximal part, which is the sinotubular junction, and your cusps are arranged in a crown-like way. Um, around the, you know, intimately connected to the aortic root. There's a beautiful paper, and I'm going to show you some cases from this, um, which is here. It's a Jack, you can link to it there. It's a Jack paper, uh, which talks through the, the different mechanisms and the anatomy of aortic valve and aortic root really beautifully. It's actually one, probably one of the best papers I've seen in this topic. So I definitely recommend looking at that article. This is a bit controversial. So how we measure, how we measure the aortic root, um, I just get the laser pointer again. So this is Chris's slide and you can tell he's trained in the UK because the BSE guidelines for measurement of the aortic root and there are four parts to it. So zooming in is really important. Sometimes turning down your dynamic compression just to make it a bit more black and white. Um, not having it over gain to lose that artifact, um, blooming artifact that you sometimes can get. So little things that you can do just to improve the quality. Um, the annulus obviously is measured well, the aortic root measurements depend, again, different between the UK, Europeans and Americans. In our lab, we follow the American guidelines, which is to do it at end diastole and measure from leading edge, which would the cursor would be up here, leading edge to leading edge. Right, so that's the convention for ASC, leading edge, where my laser pointer is, to leading edge. But the BSE guidelines do inner edge to inner edge, and they say to measure it at the best point in the cardiac cycle where you can see the aortic root best. Um, of course, when we measure the, the annulus, which is, this is actually wrong where this is, it should be here to here. When we're measuring the annulus, um, generally we measure that in um, in mid-systole, don't we? But um, yeah, so slightly different uh, depending on what guideline you read. But the key thing is, you know, you're talking millimetres um, here, so it's not a massive deal. And the key thing is whatever your unit or department is doing, um, just, just stick with that. And as long as you're all speaking the same language, then it shouldn't be too much of a problem. Um, what is abnormal? Well, it's difficult for me to give you an exact number. Um, it's different for men and women, of course. Men tend to have larger aortic roots. And the older you are, the bigger your aortic root is. So you, you really need to look at the nomograms when you're reporting. Obviously, we don't have time to do that in critical care. Right? We're going on our ward round. We're trying to do things relatively quickly. So as a ballpark, I tend to sort of have three three centimetres for the sinus of Valsalva in my head. So if I'm seeing a root that's bigger than three centimetres, then I now I need to just look a bit more carefully at the aortic root and the different components of that. Definitely, if I'm getting above three and a half, I'm paying a bit more attention to it. And 100% if, if I'm above four centimetres, then that I start to get a bit worried about that. Um, in terms of, and there's a nice paper by Goldstein talking through all this with the nomograms and everything for you to look at. 
generally surgery um, tends not to be until you know that root is more than 4.5 centimeters more more so in patients with concomitant bad AR or patients with Marfan's things like that um, but depending on the circumstance sometimes they'll leave it to 50 55 it's just um, all individualized and to be honest when they're making decisions on surgery they're not just going to be relying on definitely not just on TTE and they're going to be doing multimodal assessment anyway so I wouldn't worry too much about being millimeters out the key thing is is to not miss a dilated aortic root and just to to realize that you're not assessing the aortic valve if you're not looking at the root as well um so this I think is just showing again the normal a normal aortic valve um, so here we have aortic valve long axis. We're at the mid esophageal level. We're at 120, which is classically where we do the long axis. And then this is at, um, you know, somewhere between 40 and 60, where we get short axis of the, well, 30 to 50 usually, but here we're at 60, short short axis of the aortic valve. And you can drop your, you know, explain through that as well, just to tell because this is your right coronary here so right right ventricle here so this is right coronary and toe so different to how we see it on TTE um, where this one you know where that one's usually the right and in the near field here we have either the the left or the non again but we can drop x plane through that and that really tells us where the non is which is here because there's our intraatrial septum and then we have the right here and then left here so all looking very normal. Notice that triangular shape opening, thin leaflets and opening beautifully. Nice coaptation as well. And we can see that the as the cusps come together, we get this coaptation height, uh, which is important as well. And we'll, I'll show you some pathology. Yeah. So you've probably heard of this. This is the Sivers um, classification for bicuspid valves. I won't spend too much time on it, but um, you can have a, a type zero sort of a, a bicuspid valve which is a um, a true bicuspid if you like with um with with no raffi um and it's just two cusps with no raffi and that's um quite rare you can see about the cancer about seven percent of bicuspid valves so bicuspid valve is probably one of the more common congenital heart diseases it occurs in about one to two percent of the population um, the most common one we see, and you know, I see this not infrequently, would be a type one bicuspid valve, where we have one raffe, and it generally tends to be the right and the left that are fused. Um, that's the most common type. So here, about seventy percent is the left and right, and then we can have the type two um, bicuspid valves, which are also known as unicuspid valves, where we have the two raffe. Um, and it tends to open, you know, like in a unicuspid sort of fashion. So with that in mind, do we have any volunteers to comment on this valve? It's OK if you don't want to. This one. Sorry, oh. I'll just try and open up so I can see. Who's who's speaking? Sorry, I'm. This is annoying. Who is speaking then? Sorry. Is Richard here? Oh, hi, Richard. Yeah, yeah. So, so was it a bicuspid and a quad quad um, quad cuspid valve on the yeah. right and the left on the bicuspid? Yeah, very nice, Rishi. Lovely. Um, so what Rishi is. So obviously seen a fair few of different aortic valves now, probably working at St Vincent's for as long as you have. Um, so this is the bicuspid valve that Rishi was talking about. And um, we can see that there's thickening of the leaflets. And if I just pause it for you, um, I just want to point out how the, because it's the orifice in systole that often helps you out, right, to see these valves. You see how it's got this elliptical, elliptical shape now? It's elliptical, isn't it? Like a fish mouth almost. Um, and it's not this triangular shape, so that's a clue. And then we can also see the um, the raffi as well. So this is the raffi here. So what cusps have fused there, uh, Rishi? Yeah, if this is the non down here. Yeah, so um, right and non. Uh, right and left. Oh, left, left uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, nice, which is the more common one. Very nice. 
And patients with bicuspid valves, what is the other thing that you would want to look for here, Rishi, if you spotted a bicuspid valve? Um, what associated pathology can they sometimes have? Not sure. You know, so they, they often have aortopathies, so aortic root dilatation, that's important to look for. And rarely, I think about 1% or so, maybe maybe more actually, maybe more like 1% to 5%, I can't quite remember, have, or will also have coarctation, um, so that's important to look for. Um, and usually, more often than not, these valves will develop stenosis, so assessing the function of the valve is important, but they can also obviously develop uh, regurgitation as well. And then, as Rishi pointed out this one is if it's really rare um, this is one of Sam's toes from a while back um, which is a quadricuspid valve you see there are four cusps and there are four commissures um, but it's opening reasonably well so that's extremely rare but uh, important to spot so problems that give us aortic regurgitation they're going to be either diseases as we said that involve the cusps or the leaflets that's going to be you know cal calcification Bicuspid valves, um, these are probably the most common two things. Obviously, in the developed world, um, less rheumatic, but in you know other lower socioeconomic countries, rheumatic valve disease is still unfortunately quite prevalent. Um, and endocarditis, so we see this not infrequently, I suppose, in, in the ICU, particularly prosthetic valves. Um, diseases of the aortic root would be most commonly, I guess, patients with hypertension, obviously patients with bicuspid valves, collagen disorders. We see this a fair amount, don't we, in um, cardiothoracic centres, you know, patients getting their um, their root fixed and things. Type A dissection, that's a big one for us in the ICU, I think. And then rarely things like aortitis. Just you can see that VSD is there at the bottom. So some of the um, the outlet VSDs can have associated cusp prolapse. Um, so important if you see a cusp prolapse just to go hunting for the VSD, particularly in younger patients. So the mechanism is really important because this really guides your management. You know, the way that you manage someone like this, oh, this point of things annoying. Um, the way that you manage someone like this is going to be very different to how you manage someone like this or like this. So you have this Carpentier classification, which is really I think being extended from the mitral, um, you know, the mitral regurgitation carpentier. We don't use this language commonly, I wouldn't say, when we're talking to each other, but we certainly do describe the mechanism. And perhaps we should be saying type one, two or three, but I think it's more important that you're actually just describing what you see. Um, so basically type one A to C, there's a problem with the root. The root is dilated and it can either dilate the whole way through. So you're getting that reduced coaptation height. Um, or it can dilate just at the uh, valsalva, uh, the sinuses of valsalva, um, or it can dilate, you know, just at, at the annulus as well. Um, you can also get pathology where you get cusp perforation, and that they would all come under this umbrella of type one um, A to D. And then type two is prolapse. The way that I remember type two and three is PR, so P and then R for restriction. Um, so type two is is prolapse of the cusp and type three would be when you have these really restricted cusps either because you've got calcification degeneration or you've got rheumatic heart disease with usually with commissural fusions that's often a hallmark isn't it of um, rheumatic disease the same for mitral where you have the fusion of the commissures and then you get restriction of the thickening of the cusps and things as well um, so with that in mind and the importance of mechanism, can I have some volunteers to um, tell me the mechanism of these next four cases? Again, guys, this is the, the nice article with all of these cases on that you can look at in more detail. Um, it's that, that Jack article I was telling you about. So who wants to go first with this one? Then they're not... Um, they're not too hard, and if you get it wrong, it doesn't matter. Drew, yeah, you're going? All right, nice. I can give it a crack. Um, yeah. So it, it, the aorta looks very tubular in shape with the facement of the sinus of Valsalva. Um, and I think the coaptation height is probably reduced because of that. So I think it's a, a secondary aortic regurgitation. Um, I guess the color as well is very central, um, which further adds. Credence to that. 
Yeah, very nice, very nice, Drew. So exactly as you say, the valsalva, the sinuses of the valsalva are not too bad, but the sinotubular junction completely effaced and um, proximal ascending aorta very dilated. Um, and as you say, reduced captation height and then a lovely central jet really. And you can see this big flow convergence and a fairly large vena contractor. Uh, so very nice, very nice, Drew. Um, how about this second one? Any any takers? So we've got, in, unlike the last one, the sign the STJ is only mildly dilated, isn't it? And probably the ex ascending aorta isn't too dilated, but it's all about the sinuses here. The sinuses are massive, um, you know, six six point four centimeters. This is a huge aorta, um, and reduced captation height. And this patient also had uh, central central aortic regurgitation. Um, nice. How about this one? Can you shout out what, what you can see, anyone? It looks like there's a leaflet perforation. So we type Very on. nice, Rob. Yeah. And what leaflet would you say that was in? That's the non. Yeah, very nice. Yep. So perforation in the non coronary cusp. Uh, which I'll just point out for everyone here, there, and then we've got that really nasty looking broad, um, broad aortic regurgitant jet, haven't we? And then this is just the showing that, so we've got the right and then the non, and there's just a big gaping hole in that non uh, coronary cusp, so yeah, type 1D, I don't know, um, if I'd remember that, to be honest. Um, all right, final one. Anyone? Who me? Have a look at that. The ascending aortic roots looks um, fairly huge. Yeah, maybe. maybe. Then the actual yeah. valsalva. I agree. It does look a little dilated. Agree. Right, it is gone. What do you think of the? What do you th what's this leaflet here? Um, I can't see the image. Oh, can you not? No. You can't see it at all in me? Oh, no, no, I can see it. Yeah. Yep. Is that playing OK for you, hon? Sorry, it's probably not looping very maybe, well. Maybe there's a prolapse of one of the, like, small. Yeah, definitely. Now, what leaflet do you think it is that's prolapsing? Let me just slow that down for you. So here, if I stop it there, what leaflet do you think is prolapsing? Is that the uh, left? This one here. This is the right, isn't it? The um, because so this is hard because if you haven't done toe, then it's hard for you to um spot this. Yeah. So this is a a toe that um aortic valve long axis at 120 so we've got our right ventricle here um septum here so this is our right coronary cusp and can you see how it's prolapsing back um in, you know into the lvot whereas this is a normal a normal looking cusp pointing upwards into the into the aorta um can you see that umi yeah 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 very nice um so this is the predominant mechanism but i agree they probably i haven't measured out the It'll say in the article exactly how big the root is. It look, does look mildly dilated, but obviously depends on the age and BSA and everything. Um, and then again, we can see that lovely, so the direction of the jet, which I'm going to talk through. So it's going towards the AML, so the anterior mitral leaflet, rather than down to the intraventricular septum. We've got a large vena contractor and we've got this huge proximal flow convergence. So this is all in keeping with a you know severe aortic regurgitation from right coronary cusp prolapse. So really nice. So, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do this. Let me just get this out of the way. Um, hang on. Let me just have this appear rather than. That should be better. Uh, OK, so. Um, Yes, the differences between chronic and aort, uh, acute, we are probably all familiar with this. 
pressure volume loops are important to consider. We often start from right to left, don't we? So isovolumetric contraction, aortic valve is closed here, opens here, ejection closes again, isovolumetric relaxation, mitral valve opens and valve um, and ventricle fills again. These are our normal pressures here, which we'll all be familiar with. In acute aortic regurgitation, that left ventricle has not had time to remodel. And it's dealt with this huge regurgitant jet coming back through the aorta into the LV. It hasn't, you know, had chance to remodel, dilate, etc. So the end diastolic pressures in that left ventricle are going to go through the roof. And because we've got regurgitation, we're losing those isovolume, isovolumic periods as well. So it no longer has this beautiful sort of rectangular shape um, of the LV. It has these sort of slightly um, you know, triangular on a slant sort of um, of appearance, doesn't it? So we and the thing to point out in acute aortic regurg is this left ventricular end diastolic pressure is very very high, um, and our stroke volume is low because we haven't had time to adapt, improve, increase our LV size to to increase uh, regurgitant, um, reduce to increase forward stroke volume through the aorta. So you can see that the width of the pressure volume loops in AR um, are probably you know, similar in size because um, the stroke volume is reduced. So this patient will absolutely be in congested because the raised left ventricular and diastolic pressure, raised left atrial pressure, et cetera. They often be congested and they will be in cardiogenic shock. Whereas in a, a chronic um, uh, aortic regurgitation, that left ventricle has had time to adapt to the regurgitant to the volume load and the pressure load if you like it undergoes usually eccentric remodeling so you don't often see those small really thick concentric remodeled ventricles like you do in aortic stenosis so you have this eccentric remodeling so it often looks dilated and there's ex there's a, a high lv mass but you might not necessarily see increased wall thickness um, but it's the mass that's increased so this big beefy really eccentric uh, remodeled lv and um, as you can see, because they've had chance to adapt, usually they have, you know, slightly higher, but not too bad um, end diastolic pressures if they're compensated. Um, again, they don't have those isovolumetric uh, periods because the, the, the aortic valve's gone, um, but their stroke volume has managed to increase. So these patients are often, you know, they can be asymptomatic, as we know. And um, we can see the corresponding pressure changes there. So an acute AR shocked hypotensive really high left ventricular end diastolic pressures a really high left atrial pressures um, whereas in the chronic ars usually those usually those filling pressures are you know just manageable so the patients are not too symptomatic however if we bring that patient to the icu and we give them all of the insults in icu and this is why it's important to you know recognize those with chronic because quite often we tip them over into acute on chronic or decompensated states um, where they can absolutely develop these high filling pressures um, you know and develop worsening shock and congestion and things uh, related to that um, so often things like you know if they come in with sepsis and we're giving them lots and lots of noradrenaline to really squeeze them we're going to make everything a lot worse um, as you will all be familiar with. So how do we grade the severity of chronic aortic regurgitation? If you haven't read these guidelines, they are a must really, uh, especially for those, I think for those doing exams, DDU or ASC, you really just need to, to have a look through these. They're an excellent resource. I'm sure you've all seen them. And you'll probably be familiar with this table, which goes through AR severity of chronic AR severity, I must say. Um, so looking at, and we'll go through each of these, looking at structural parameters, uh, Doppler, which can be qualitative, um, either with, you know, colour or um, continuous wave and things, or semi-quantitative parameters that we can use with Doppler, such as vena contractor. And, um, and more quantitative things, which this is really hard to do in the critically ill. I think a lot of the rest of this we can usually do um, reasonably well, but this is often um, hard to do. The key things for you all to be aware of for the exams is really what's in this severe column. Um, and you need to just have a way of remembering some of these numbers, particularly for the American exams. Um, and we'll go through you know, these these numbers would be important to know, um, as with these numbers here. I wouldn't worry too much about sort of this group here. 
Um, obviously, if you can remember the mild, then great. But this is really the key, the key one for, for exams, especially the DDU, probably the American. You need to know these two. Um, so let's go through. Let's go through some of this in a bit more detail and try to make it make it a little bit more palatable and rememberable um, so you can remember it a bit better. So 2D imaging, which we talked through, really important. So this valve here, again, we're in a toe view. So this is right coronary cusp, left coronary cusp. The aortic root doesn't look too dilated. We have thickened leaflets, probably restricted motion of this leaflet. And you can see that there are some echo densities um, on the leaflet tips. And you can see that there is a clear coaptation defect um, with this valve. With this patient, we can see that there's been extensive remodeling of this LV. It's dilated, it's severely impaired. We also have a very dilated aortic root and we can't see very much of the um, aortic valve here. Colour Doppler um, is the next thing that we would do after we've done a really careful 2D interrogation. And we can look qualitatively at this, which is oft what often what we do as soon as we put colour on. And we can see from this patient here, we're probably, you know, you can see this regurgitant jet here. The vena contractor looks quite narrow, doesn't it? If I slow that down and measure it, it looks less than 0.3. Um, centimeters, but we'd need to look at that in more views and uh, interrogate that some more. But this looks like a, a mild to moderate jet, um, as opposed to this one here, where we've got really broad, very turbulent flow. Um, and this is looking like more like a severe um, aortic regurgitant jet. Of course, when you are using color, always make sure that you're looking up at your scale, make sure it's between 50 and 70. Um, and have your colour box, you know, set correctly um, to, you know, just improve accuracy and things. Because some of the measurements that we are doing, such as vena contractor, they're very tiny measurements, right? You're talking millimetres. So important when you're doing them that you're zooming in as much as possible. And if you are doing a vena contractor, ideally, you need to be able to see the flow convergence zone the vena contractor, which is the narrowest part through the jet, as well as the, the jet expansion or the jet area. So three components to a jet and you want to be measuring in your jet. It, the jet direction is important as well. So this one's central. But remember the last one I showed you with the prolapse of the right, it was pointing, the jet was going towards your anterior mitral leaflet. And so if I was going to measure the vena contractor on this one, I would want to do it perpendicular to the direction of the jet, right? So I would do it like here. But if this jet was pointing upwards towards the anterior mitral leaflet, I wouldn't still measure in this in this axis. I'd measure again perpendicular to the direction of that jet. So that would be important as well. Um, again, important that when you're using color Doppler, that you're coming through all of your uh, views. So this is your parasternal views your apical view, so your apical uh, three and five view, so we're in a three chamber here. Um, and often, you know, you if you're going to be using these views to line up your continuous wave Doppler, you just need a little bit of patience just to really try and line up the the Doppler um, as best you can um, along the, the axis of, of the jet coming through as well. And we can see here a patient with a, you know, mild to probably mild, but it's difficult, mild to, mild to moderate uh, jet coming through there, not too broad, um, you know, not filling the whole LV cavity, which is a bit of a soft marker, to be honest, because it all, of course, the, you know, how far the jet's traveling is dependent on the pressure difference between the aorta and the diastolic pressure in the LV, um, which is impacted by anything that alters your left ventricular compliance. So in the critically ill, not that appropriate to do that. But we can see that we've got a relatively narrow jet not extending too far in, um, which is probably mild to moderate. And then this patient would have, you know, look at that awful, terrible, just really turbulent, really broad, um, extending all the way back to the top of the LV. So this is looking, you know, without any further information, obviously would never call severity based on colour alone, um, but this is looking more like a, you know, at least moderate, if not severe um, aortic regurgitation. You can see a proximal flow convergence, probably a really large vena contractor um, and the jet travelling all the way back. So these are the things that we can look at with, with qualitative Doppler, Doppler really um, using color. So we can look at the 
the jet width in the LVOT, which is kind of what I was just doing there, just to get a feel, is this mild, severe? And you can see it's not perfect and it's one piece of the jigsaw puzzle. But if you're seeing that really large jet width within your LVOT, it's more likely to be severe. Um, but it's obviously if you've got that eccentric jet, uh, particularly with leaflet problems, so prolapse or restriction or perforation where you have that eccentric jet that can be completely off, can't it? And usually sometimes you actually only get this really sort of you get this sort of colour splay, if you like, rather than a, a, a you know, a nice sort of um, large vena contractor. If you're seeing a flow convergence, um, at all, any flow convergence, then you're probably dealing with more like moderate, um, moderate AR because it's unlikely in a mild jet that you will get significant flow convergence. You can have very tiny ones, but if you're seeing a, an obvious flow convergence zone, um, so that sort of rounded PISA, um, just distal to the valve, then um, just proximal to the valve is coming through, then it's more likely to be at least moderate. And um, semi-quantitatively, we can, of course, measure vena contractor and we can look at the width compared to the LVOT width as well. So I'll show you some of that. So this is what I was meaning by you need to be able to see um, the three components of a jet, which is the flow convergence here, the vena contractor, which is that narrowest portion through the jet, um, which is less flow dependent. Um, and then you have this flow expansion or the jet area. And we would measure again, it's important to zoom in so you've got the best um, accuracy for trying to measure vena contractor because, you know, three millimeters determine whether, you know, something's mild or severe. So really important to be accurate with that um, and zoom in. And you can see that obviously they're not measuring the vena contractor here to here. They're doing it perpendicular to the direction of that jet because this is a this is one of those jets that's uh, the direction of the jet is towards the anterior mitral leaflet again. Um, so probably a right coronary cusp problem um, just based on that. That's difficult to know. Uh, so this would be a mild, mild AR, less than 0.3 centimetres, moderate between three and six millimetres and then severe um, more than six millimetres. Now you can also look at the jet height compared to LVOT ratio, which width, which I think um, we've got here. Um, so you can measure the LVOT height and you can measure the the width of the jet um, and if that's less than 25 percent then it's mild but if in like this one it's more than 65 percent then that that's, tends to be severe this is um you can do that in 2d it's also quite nice to do it in color m mode um, it's one of the times when a aortic regurge is actually one of the times where i do use a fair bit of color m mode it's really quite nice um, and you can imagine you can measure the the lvot or the aortic jet um, the aortic height and then the jet height here. And if it's more than around 65%, again, that's a piece of the jigsaw puzzle that you're dealing with um, severe severe aortic regurgitation. Um, and it also gives you, you Yeah. Can I ask? Mm. It's Andrew here. Yes. So for a complex jet like you showed on one of your earlier slides just a few slides ago, can you realistically? Yes, that one. This one. Yes. How do you go about measuring or can you possibly measure the vena contractor width in, in a jet like that? Yeah, I agree, Andrew, absolutely. And this is one of the pit, pitfalls of it when you've got really severe, nasty, you know, sort of eccentric jets and you can't see a clear. And often, you know, this patient has, you can see that they've got calcified aortic valve and they've also got concomitant aortic stenosis. So you can get all sorts of splay and sort of blooming artifact and things. And really picking out where that vena contractor is can be extremely difficult. Um, so if you can't see it and you can't measure it beautifully, I would just avoid measuring it because um, you're just going to make mistakes and you just have to use some of the other um, pieces of the jigsaw puzzle, if you like, and um, accept that you can't see a nice a clear being a contractor. Usually there's lots of other clues, though, to look at. Um, but you're exactly right, Andrew. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, the other thing that you can do is um, also look at the you know, you can look at the the cross sectional area of the jet um, in the LVO compared to the LVOT cross sectional area, but you can only really do this again with the central jets. Um, and you can do it with 3D as well. Um, you can do 3D vena contractor, but this is how you would do that. You would measure the area of this jet here compared to the LVOT area. 
And again, um, more than 60, I think more than 60% is it for that year, more than 60% would be consistent with severe. So a few different ways to do it there. Um, none are perfect, but um, usually in the sort of outpatient setting, you can generally get good views to do all of these measurements. Actually, it's a bit harder in the in the ICU. So I think I've mentioned most of these important to be usually we do it at the vena contractor. Usually we do it in the long axis view because you get the best um, axial resolution zoomed image because you want to be as accurate as you can be and you want to do it perpendicular to the jet um, and it's that narrowest jet diameter. Um, that's just 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 at or proximal to the valve. That's what the vena contractor That's where you would measure. Um, it's difficult to do sometimes in eccentric jets, but if you, as I said, if it's pointing towards the AML or the septum and you still can see those three components, um, you still can can measure it. Um, a good thing of it is it's less load dependent than some of the others, which is why, you know, we like it in the ICU. Um, and yeah, if you've got a really small vena contractor, that's often reassuring, less than three. And if it's, you know, Often it just fills the whole height of your LVOT if it's really severe and it's quite obvious. Pitfalls would be if you've got lots of a complex jet with multiple orifices. Um, bicuspid valves, you tend to get, um, you know, sort of changes in in direct, like the, the jet direction can be highly eccentric. Um, you can get split color splay and things like that. So it can often be quite tricky in those kind of valves. Um, Ideally, when we're doing vena contractor measurement, you should as a C3, say, be able to see three components of the jet um, if you're going to measure it. But of course, in mild in mild AI, you don't often see that flow convergence. So that's certainly true. But um, yeah, you will need to know these numbers for your exams. And um, but yeah, for clinical practice, I think knowing the difference between mild and severe is probably um, most clinically helpful. So the the some of the tricks with doing jet height jet 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 height or width to LVOT width, um, similar to the vena contractor things really, um, you want to measure the jet width though within one centimeter of the vena contractor, and you need to measure it at the same point that you're measuring the LVOT, um, which I think is it shows you in this one. So um, when you're doing this technique, you're not measuring at the vena contractor, but you're measuring at the same place that you're measuring your LVOT diameter. Um, and if it's more than 60% severe, as I say, I think M mode is is good for this um, color M mode. Emma, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, mm -hmm. Just a question with that that last slide. Is it? Um, I always thought that the the real eccentric jets, it, it might be really hard to get an accurate estimation. Um, just because it's kind of angulated. Is that true? Do I yes. need a central jet to do the the, the width of your T? I, you, get, you, I guess it gives you a, a minimum at least, hey? Yeah, it does. But, but you you take it with a little, you know, you would never hang your hat on it, hey, if it was eccentric. And you would state that it was eccentric. Okay. Um, but, you know, perhaps still put what the values are. You can okay. still measure, you can still measure vena contractor um, and, and this, you know, jet to LVOT ratio um, if it is eccentric, but, um, you know, multiple jets or, you know, really nasty sort of splay eccentric jets, you can't. Yeah. Um, but if you've got these ones that are either going towards the AML or the, the septum, you, of, you often can still see the nice three components, so flow convergence, vena contractor, jet width. So in, in this one, even though it's not beautifully central, you can still, as you can still, 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 you can still measure it. Yeah, yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah. Um, there's some of the problems with this, obviously, we've mentioned eccentric jets might not be perfect. Um, and that, you know, your AR jet, you can imagine, you know, it can do unpredictable things once you get past the LVOT as well. So even because you're only measuring it at the LVOT site and it can, you know, expand and and have more, flow, you know, momentum of flow um, once it gets past that. Um, so it can be tricky sometimes so none of these are perfect but there are some things that you can do to to make um make your measurements better and as i say you're never going to hang your hat on one thing so it's about putting it all together um as with all valve things so then moving on to continuous wave doppler for aortic regurgitation 
uh, assessment. Um, I think Chris was just trying to show here that it's important to have your alignment right because if you're if you've got a really if your alignment is poor or you've got a really eccentric jet then your continuous wave doppler is not going to tell you very much um, so generally if you have a good alignment usually in your five maybe sometimes in your three um, you know if you've got a slightly angulated aorta and things you're going to put continuous wave through and it'll give you a little bit of um, it'll give you some different information so the things that we look at with um, continuous wave would be the density so that's a qualitative thing that we can look at so if you're seeing a really dense jet so completely filled jet obviously we have the um, you know early diastolic point here and late diastolic point here and if this is all filled in and really dense then that's going to be more in keeping with sort of a moderate to severe um, regurgitant jet because it's telling you there's you know higher volume of blood coming through so very qualitative if it's faint or incomplete that's going to be more in keeping with a mild jet but of course imagine if you've got a really eccentric jet then you could be you could absolutely only get a faint or incomplete trace um, and I see that not infrequently actually people hanging a lot on the continuous wave Doppler um, both in terms of pressure half time and the appearance of it and and really just you know, hanging so much on that and not looking at everything else and and either massively undercalling the severity or overcalling the severity. So please don't make that mistake. Um, understand the caveats when you when anything is related to Doppler angle dependent. It's only ever going to be as good as your angle. And um, yeah, recognize that, you know, this is not perfect. You know, there's often overlap between mod moderate and severe with the density. The pressure half time is um, something that we use routinely. I must admit, I use it obviously all the time in the outpatient setting in the ICU. I tend to very naughty. I tend to sort of eyeball it and look more at the density, to be honest, and and put the whole clinical picture together rather than spending too long measuring it out. And often, you know, often it's hard to see right i mean here textbook it's beautiful you know exactly where the early point is the late point is and you draw a line and it works it out for you but i mean this one i wouldn't be terribly sure that that's exactly where we should be putting it you can see on this one you can hardly see where you would be putting that and often there's so much variation beat to beat as well um with atrial fibrillation or you know for whatever whatever reason you know movement with the ventilator things like that so it's often really hard to get an accurate pressure half time i think in in the critical care setting um anyway so the pressure half time is really telling you how quickly your left ventricular end diastolic your left ventricular end diastolic pressure and your aortic diastolic pressure are equalizing um, so obviously if they're rapidly equalizing that means that you've got a hell of a lot of blood going back through and you're getting ra rapid pressure equalization in severe aortic rego so you're going to have a, a very short pressure half time generally less than 200 milliseconds if you've only got a mild uh, regurgitant volume or regurgitant fraction then you're not going to you're going to take a while to equalize right because you've only got a bit of blood coming through so therefore your pressure half time tends to be you know sort of more than 500 if it's mild and you have sort of this gray zone in between of moderate 200 to 500 milliseconds there are some important caveats to that this is often what it can look like in the icu you know this one's quite parabolic this one you know do i put it there there this one looks different they all just look different um but you can Look, you can measure it if you want to, which is what's been done here. It gives you a bit of an idea. It looks pretty dense. It's less than 200. You can see here on the screen, there's a big broad jet You're starting to put that, you know, that puzzle together that you're probably dealing with uh, with a severe jet, um, a se severe regurgitant jet there. So some of the pearls for pressure half time, um, which has said that the angle is everything. So you need to really align that continuous wave Doppler with the flow and um, you know, just check between your five chamber and your three chamber where that where that is and line and uh, try and line it up as best you can. Um, in your your parasternal long axis view might, might is actually sometimes better, especially if those jets are, you know, if it's a right, if it's a leaflet problem, um, like a right coronary cusp leaflet problem and your jet is pointing down to your AML um, and to your mitral leaflet, you can often line it up then quite nicely. Um, in your parasternal long axis. Um, you just have to put your colour on and see what direction it's it's travelling in. 
So, I mean, it is fairly simple to do. It does uh, give us some information. Again, I think it's more for the outpatient chronic AR setting. Um, we can absolutely make mistakes um, if there's poor alignment. And as I said, it's that pressure gradient, which is really important. And in the ICU, our and our filling pressures are changing so dynamically um, that it's really hard to know, you know, is it because of the regurgent volume coming through or is it because my end diastolic pressure is high that I'm getting rapid pressure equalization? So, for example, if you've got a patient with mild aortic regurg, but a really high left ventricular filling pressure, then that's going to rapidly um, equalise and you're going to get a really short pressure half time, even though they've only got mild aortic regurge. So that's the, that's the key take home really about the pressure half time. It's hugely impacted by filling pressures, uh, which are highly dynamic in our group. Um, it's important to be really systematic, as you can probably get a feel for when you're assessing AR. Um, probably, you know, when time is a bit against you and you've got a really sick patient and you need to pull out some things. Usually it's for me, it's 2D colour and then straight to um, pulse wave Doppler, actually, because I want to be seeing what what's happening in the descending aorta in my suprasternal views to see whether I'm dealing with severe aortic regurgitation. Um, and also a little thing that we can, not a little thing, but a thing that you can often get a clue from is if you've got a really high LVOT VTI, you know, obviously there's many causes for this, but if you're seeing bad regurge with colour and then you're getting a VTI of 36 and you're thinking this is probably a lot of blood, um, you know, that's coming sort of back through my LV. Um, so it's probably significant um, regurge. There's no cutoff value for mild, moderate, severe with VTI. Um, and you often see this. What's is anyone? What's this what I'm pointing at here? So what have we got here? So we've got. LVOT flow which is nice and laminar, um, but a high volume. But what's this where my laser pointer is here? It's aliasing from the regurgitation. Very nice, very nice. Yeah, lovely. Um, all right, so this is this is key for our populations because what we really care about, isn't it really, is there severe AR that's causing my patient to be shocked or congested and do I need to do something about it quickly. Um, so suprasternal views are um, easier than you think to get, actually. Um, so pointer usually at the sort of one o'clock position. Um, just extend the neck a little bit and you get a view that looks like this, uh, where we have aorta and you have your three branches and then your descending aorta. Um, your right pulmonary artery is here. You have a bit of a fatty limbus here. Um, and then we put colour through that. So sometimes you don't need to use pulse wave Doppler. It's just it can be really obvious just with putting colour on. So what I can see here, if I just pause that and come through, I can see. Forward flow, OK, it's a little bit turbulent. Just again, checking my scale. I'm at 90, so I'm good. I don't think I'm messing it up because of that. And then as I'm coming through systole, you're getting that forward flow through down into the descending and then in diastole. Sorry, you can't see the um, ECG there. In diastole, I'm getting this whole lot of red blood back, um, back of my aorta. So again, just eyeballing that, I can say this is, you know, likely to be significant severe aortic regurgitation. Um, and again, the further away, so that's our suprasternal view, but really what we ought to be doing, um, which I don't see us do often enough actually, is look, in, look at the abdominal aorta. Because if you're seeing hollow diastolic flow reversal in your abdominal aorta, that's a very specific sign for aortic regurgitation. It's not perfect. Yes, you can get it with other things like fistulas, ruptured sinuses of valsalva, some dissections and things like that. But if you've already gone through your, you know, your... Um, your you know pieces of the puzzle earlier on and then you come to this and you see that then it's just that final piece where you think you know I'm, I'm highly suspicious this is severe and I think the mechanism is ABC um, this is a nice cherry on top for that and it's really crucial that you so often I've seen I haven't but I've seen some reporting doctors actually not report on the severity of AR unless there's been interrogation of the aorta and they'll actually call the patient back to clinic just to get the aortic views 
um, to, to comment on severity, but especially in those where you, you've gone through all the other parameters and you're still thinking, is this moderate or severe? And there's no aortic windows. It's really hard to make a call. So I definitely see I've seen that happen. Um, so important to look at the um, you know, the downstream effects of the regurgitation. So this is nice again. And again, it's one of the times where I do use color M mode uh, through putting just, you know, just putting your M mode, then hitting color, putting having color on and hitting M mode. And it gives you this beautiful picture. And that's just the last case that you could, the last loop that you could see there. So we've got for, forwards flow um, in systole. And then we've got this, a lot of backwards flow in diastole in keeping with severe, um, aortic regurgitation. So forwards flow, backwards flow in diastole, forward flow, backwards flow. And then we can also look at that with pulse wave Doppler. It's telling us the same. These two are telling us the same thing, just different modalities. So forward flow in systole, backwards flow in diastole throughout the whole of diastole. Um, there is a bit of a cutoff, isn't there, of like 0.2 meters per second for, for this, you know, to be significant. I don't think too many people hang their hat on that. I do sort of eyeball it and have a look. But if I'm seeing this kind of pattern, um, you know, especially if I'm seeing this in the descending abdominal aorta um, with all the other things, then it's severe. Um, any questions about that? Um, I think we've talked through talked through any most of that. Um, can be seen in other, yeah, other conditions. And of course, yeah, in the elderly where they've got stiff aortas, you can often see this um, brief, you know, reversal of flow, but it generally it isn't holodiastolic. So I still find it's helpful in that sort of setting. Um, so that's, those are the main things actually in AR severity. Um, 2D, colour, pulse wave, continuous wave see the whole heart, look for the remodeling and look at the up and the downstream effects. That's that's the thing that you go through, same as with all of your other valves. And of course, you do need to be aware, as I said at the beginning, of these quantitative parameters of regurgitant volume, regurgitant fractions um, and EROAs. And I don't know, it's hard to remember this sometimes, but for and it might true regurg, it's the four, five, six, seven rule, isn't it? So four. For EROA, regurgitant fraction 50 of the five, regurgitant volume 60, and then the vena contractor seven. So four, five, six, seven for MR. And then I don't know, for AR, it's three, five, six, six. So three, 50, 60. 0.6. I don't know whether your brain works like that, but it's sometimes when you've got all these different numbers. That's um, a little thing that I use to try and help me. So the way that you would do the quant quantitative things would be to measure similar to what you do for, you know, other for your mitral regurg and things like that. Measure what's coming in through your mitral inflow. So, um, you know, cross sectional area of your mitral valve. So mitral valve an annulus, um, mitral valve VTI and then what's coming out of your LVOT. And then the difference between those things is going to be your regurgitant, uh, regurgitant volume. Um, you can use PISA techniques. I don't see anyone really using that to quantify um, in AR, but you can. Um, and then, of course, if you're really stuck, then some of these patients, especially with the chronic AR and things, will have you know MRIs because that's really the gold standard for being able to do these quantitative measures uh, very well. And this is kind of what I, how I think of severe AR. This is the kind of sort of card that I would make, I suppose, if I was doing it for for the exam again. Um, so 2D, if I'm seeing disrupted aortic valve apparatus or a really abnormal route, I'm thinking, you know, that 2D abnormality is more, more likely for this to be severe. Colour Doppler, if it's filling more than 65% of the LVOT or the vena contractors more than 0.6, big flow convergence. If I'm seeing diastolic mitral regurg, that's telling me that this patient is either decompensated with their high mm. left ventricular end diastolic pressure or this is acute. Um, most often acute if you're seeing diastolic MR. Pulse wave Doppler, you know, look at the aorta, hollow diastolic flow reversal. Continuous wave Doppler, um, is it steep? Is the pressure half time less than 200? And what's the density if it's really dense, more likely? And then all of your quantitative things. There is this thing as well of the 50 50 rule for AR. So if your EF is 
less than 50 and your left ventricular end systolic diameter is more than 50. That's in the guidelines as sort of cutoffs for when to consider surgery. And it's the 40-60 rule, isn't it, for MR? So um, EF less than 60% and left ventricular end systolic diameter more than 40. So 40-60 for MR, 50-50 for AR. So acute AR, um, as I mentioned, completely different ball game, often shocked and um, congested. And a few things that we can look at. The key thing is obviously the clinical history, right, in the exam. If they've got acute aortic regurg, they're going to be sick as a dog, as I say, in cardiogenic shock um, and really, really sick. There's often no remodeling. So you normally have a normal LV size, normal LA size. Um, you haven't got that sort of eccentric remodeling. They love to ask questions like this in the American exams. So they'll give you this M mode picture and nothing else and they'll say, describe the pathology or something like that. Um, and what they're showing here is you can imagine if you've got this huge jet coming back, right, from your aorta in diastole, just as the anterior mitral leaflet's wanting to open, um, just as it's it's opening in diastole and then you've got this big jet coming, hitting it. It's going to close, isn't it, as well? So it's going to have premature closure um, because it's got that big jet hitting it. So if you see, so here we've got the the mitral valve just opening in diastole and, um, you know, it's closing way before the end of diastole. Normally you'd have an air wave here, but you get this sort of blunting of your air wave when you've got severe AR. So then it looks like you get this um, premature close premature closure of your mitral valve. So that's one feature that you can look for on M mode. With continuous wave or even just with colour, you can look for, can anyone tell me what this is here? What we're looking at here? You can probably see the little, like what's happening here. Let's just see where it is. Yeah. It is the MR jet, so it's parabolic, it's close to six metres per second, it's pan-systolic. Yes, yeah, so that's the MR in systole. The ECG tracing is a bit rubbish, sorry for that. Anyone else spot the the other thing that's happening? This is, the, they did give this to me in my DDU Viber, actually. There's some diastolic MR. Very nice, yeah. It's one of... Um, it's one of Sam's favourite things, so look at this, remember it, because he's probably going to ask you about, about it in the Viva. He loves to show these kind of Doppler pictures because um, it does, it shows a real understanding of what you're what you're looking at. So, yeah, can you all see that? So this is diastolic mitral regurg here. It's in diastole. It's, um, you know, going from the LV into the LA. This is systolic MR. Um, how about what's happening here? Any... Any takers on this one? Again, this is one of those spot diagnoses things that come up in American exams. It's fluttering of the anterior mitral leaflet. Very nice, yep. Yeah. Very nice. So fluttering of the anterior mitral leaflet, again, another sign of significant aortic regurgitation. Um, and how about this one from Feigenbaum? We don't often look for this, do we? This is um opening of the aortic valve. Yeah, early opening, very nice. Early opening of the aortic valve because you've got that really high left ventricular end diastolic pressure, higher than the diastolic root aortic root pressure, and it opens the, the valve early. Um very nice. All right, some cases then. So 87 year old female. Have we got a volunteer for this one actually? Just so I can uh, I'm going to open up the things so I can actually see you because it's hard for me to to communicate with you all when I can't see you. Any volunteers for this one? They're all quite short. Don't worry, you can just say what you see. It doesn't matter if you get things wrong. I get things wrong all the time. Any takers? Um, I just keep getting called in and out a lot on clinical here, so I'm sorry. Oh, but, no, no um, problem, Niall. Yeah, all good. Um, I can give it a go. Yeah, who's speaking? Sorry. Yeah, it's Drew. Drew, perfect. All right. Um, OK, go for it, Drew. So it's a case of an 87-year-old gentleman who went to the cath lab 
and uh, had a drug looting stent and deteriorated rapidly uh, with increased inotropes on the background of a bioprosthetic aortic valve replacement. Yep. Yep. So I'm thinking perhaps a complication of the procedure itself, um, whether that is an instant stenosis, like thrombosis and cardiogenic shock from that, or if there's perhaps a valvular uh, dysfunction as a complication of, of the coronary, um, of the angiogram. This is uh, the aortic bloom pump tracing, just to... Anyway, it's not an exam on that, but it's just showing a lack of augmentation of the, we'll get onto the echo. <laughs> right, so this is peristernal long axis view 2D. Um, the key uh, key finding being that the left ventricle appears hyperdynamic, the left atrium's enlarged, there's fluttering of the anterior mitral leaflet, and looking at the aortic valve, um, Difficult to see exactly in this view, but there there may be a um, defect, perhaps a perforation or dysfunction of the aortic valve leaflet. Yeah, I agree. I agree, Drew. I'll just take you on before we come back and look at it a bit more. Yeah, so um, I guess I can, the key finding here is a color on the aortic valve shows a, a large um, LVOT a ratio of, to color, uh, filling up the entire LVOT. Um, looking at my Nyquist limit, which is 64, so that's okay. Um, I also, as a, uh, the vena contracta width is quite large as well. I can't see a flow convergence zone in this particular view, but we would zoom in. He also has some associated mitral regurgitation, um, which we can characterize further later. Yeah, I might just slow that down for everyone as well. It's just coming back. So that really, that's what you're talking about, that really broad, nasty looking jet. And if we did do a, you know, vena contractor on that, it'd be very wide, wouldn't it? It's almost filling, it's almost like almost 100% of the the jet width um, is filling the LVOT width, as you said. And can you see, and this is obviously, it's a bioprosthetic valve, which makes it a bit trickier. Um, but you can see that there's some colour also heading up there into the aortic root. Can you see this nasty bit of colour there? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's just a little, looks a little bit thickened to me, this aortic um, root. And then maybe there is, let's just see and go through whether there's some, There's there probably is a little bit of um, late diastolic MR as well uh, just happening. See this little bit here? Probably a little bit of, you can see that with colour, a little bit of late diastolic MR coming through um, just before that systolic jet comes through. All right. Uh, so this is a continuous wave Doppler in a five chamber view, the apex, apical five chamber view. Um, it shows a, a dense uh, CW trace with a very short pressure half time of 90 milliseconds. Um, this is a, a peristernal or a suprasternal image of the aorta um, with color Doppler on the left, and then uh, I believe that's a pulse wave, um, which shows that there's diastolic reversal in the aortic in the uh, descending aorta. Um, the end diastolic measurement of that regurg of that reversal seems to be over 0.2 meters per second, indicating severe theoretic regurgitation. So if you had to summarize that in a sense, summarize for a conclusion, Drew, and what you'd like to do next, what would you, how would you say, what would you say? Uh, so I think the patient's acute decompensation is secondary to uh, acute aortic regurgitation, acute, acute severe aortic regurgitation. Is that enough? Yeah, yeah. Um, it, with a, a patient with a balloon pump in, um, with a bioprosthetic valve, with what looks like a the mechanism is probably a primary valvular problem, yeah. um, and that balloon pump is definitely making things a lot worse. Ah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what needs to what this lady ended up dying actually. So we didn't actually get to see this before my time at Nepean, but um. This they didn't actually get to find out exactly what the etiology of this was. 
yeah. you know but it's highly suspicious isn't it it's really so there's echogenic mass you know on the aortic valve leaflet it's hard to see exactly what leaflet it is but it looks to be flailing through into the lvot um you know there's a bit of it's hard to tell you know with tte she needed to have a toe and things as well but there is a bit of thickening of the aortic root and you wonder whether um you know she might have had some endocarditis potentially of, of that valve or whether it has been that rare sort of disruption of the valve during the procedure um either way it seems to be a, a leaflet problem that's causing severe aortic regurgitation. and this the last thing this patient needs is a balloon pump right this is the last treatment that you want to give this patient um she ended up um, unfortunately dying but yeah very nice um this is the kind of thing that they will give you in the viva. So, you know, sort of a stem, the key things to pick out from the stem, you know, the bioprosthetic valve, the fact that she's had a balloon pump in um, with the valve sort of history and that she gets worse despite that. You're already sort of thinking before it starts, which is exactly what you did, Drew, um, that it could, you know, it could be a, a valve problem. Um, so that's nice. I mean, she was quite an old lady and, and quite frail and things anyway. So I'm not sure things would have been necessarily different if she you know, was was in a surgical center at this stage. Um, anyway, and then, yeah, sorry. Oh, no, go on. Um, uh, just the, the color that you noted in the kind of the sinus valsalva there, the, the, that, that flow, uh, what, do you, what do you think? Like a more of a kind of an abscess sort of thing? Like I, the, I definitely want to look source. at it more. Absolutely. Yeah, so yeah. I'd want to be looking at this valve closely with a with more TTE views and toe views because they're complementary, aren't they? Especially in aortic valves because you get dropout in different areas with toe and TTE. And yeah. certainly, you know, explaining explaining that 3D, looking to see is there an aortic root abscess for sure? Because that's not you sometimes you can get a little, you know, some gaps around the valve and things. But yeah, in, in the history where you've got a, a what looks like a, a valve problem and that nasty colour jet going up into the that sort of slightly thickened route, you'd worry about that. You definitely want to look at it more. Um, but yeah, really nice pickup of of things there. And you can see even just with the colour, that awful red turbulent flow coming back up through. Um, and then you yeah, have this diastolic flow reversal, which we're seeing here, here, here. Not perfect, is it? And they probably ask you, you know, if you get to critique that as well, like how you would optimise this image, um, you know, reducing the low pass filter to not have this gap here maybe reducing the gain down a little bit um all of those things um well done drew so he wants to take this second one so you have a oh. 70 year old woman who presents with dyspnea background of body control hypertension diabetes chronic kidney disease she presents with chest pain she's got quite a large pulse pressure um 130 over 45. She's speaking four sentences. Yep. So I'm guessing this is an acute pathology. So we have a parasternal um, long axis view. Uh, and the, the LV already looks fully contractile and dilated. The aortic valve appears to be coapting normally, although it's the I can see the right coronary cusp. Uh, sorry, the right um, uh, cusp of the aortic valve. The left one I can't visualize that clearly at this stage. The LA looks to be of normal dimensions, and the mitral valve looks grossly normal. So this is the this is the LV outflow view. So the, so the sonographer has gone slightly off axis here, Andrew, yes. Um, yes. and it, moved slightly higher up the chest I um, see, to, I to see. better visualize the aorta. Yes, yes. Yeah. I'm with you now, so I can see that it's a slightly um, asymmetric view of the um, left ventricular outflow tract. And we can see that the 
aortic, certainly the, the proximal aorta appears to be dilated. Very nice, Andrew. Yeah. yeah is, um, is there anything that you can see within that that concerns you? Yes, there is an app. There's a sort of a shadow there that I that concerns me just um, just distal to the sinus, um, which doesn't appear to be consistent with a normal anatomic structure, certainly not the aortic valve. Um, so I'd be very concerned whether that may even be a and a, you know ab abnormality in the in the proximal aorta like a dissection flap very nice andrew yeah yeah okay so putting color through it um there's a lot of uh turbulence and aliasing happening um i can see uh even a bit of mr happening yeah very nice i'll just slow uh, that down to show you the the jet coming back through there. Yes. Yeah. OK. OK, so now going through the. Five chamber view long axis or apical five chamber view. Um, to visualize the LVOT. I can visualize the. Um, aortic valve and there's certainly an abnormality distal to the aortic valve with um, a linear shadowing across there, just distal to the valve, yeah, which is strongly suspicious for a dissection flap. Um, and indeed, the color sh confirms the presence of a very large regurgitant jet into the LV. Absolutely, I'll with, just slow that with, down. Yeah, with very, um, which is filling the LVOT, so the Jet width to the LVOT diameter is certainly significantly elevated. It's almost uh, it's well over sixty percent, so suggestive of severe aortic regurgitation. So now that we've got color Doppler through the LVOT, we can see that there is a very dense color wave Doppler of the aortic regurgitant jet. Continuous um, wave Doppler. Sorry, Are continuous wave Doppler. I beg your pardon. Yes. yes. Um, it's quite a dense, um, a dense color wave. Con sorry, continuous wave. Um, yeah. Yeah. Suggestive again of of a of a, um, of a severe regurgitant jet. Yes, the pressure half time is not measured out here. No, um, but it looks it? it certainly looks like it's going to be quite um, reduced, isn't it? Yes. What's the cutoff for severe? That you sort of have in mind. So the cutoff for severe, the pressure half time of less than two hundred milliseconds. Very nice. Yeah. And this is the it looks like a supersternal view through the descending aorta. No, I beg your pardon. That's the um, subcostal view. Yeah, very nice. Um, and what is it showing there? It's showing. A very dilated, looks like it's a dilated IVC. So, yeah, what, do, what what vessel is, is this here, Andrew? Is that one of the hepatic veins? This this one here? Oh, this is I the, beg your pardon. Yes. That's the, um, uh, is that the, is the, the, the IVC? It's not the IVC, is it? No, so this is the descending aorta, um, abdominal aorta, and the reason you can ah, tell okay. those those apart, you know, being expansile doesn't always help, or pulsatile doesn't always help you. So the things yes. to know, you you can't. This is a modified subcostal. You see how you've got the LV in short axis. Got so it. for yeah. for this to tick the boxes for yes, this is IVC. You need to see the right atrium. Yes. You need to see the vessel draining into the right atrium. And yes. generally, what you see is the hepatic vein coming off as well. If it's IVC, yes. we're not yes. seeing any of that. Um, and it's and it's pulsatile. So what's happened is we've been, we're in the subcostal and we're just tilting down to fan through the aorta. Okay. Um, the descending aorta. And what can you notice here in the descending aorta? Yes. Again, this an Elliot abnormality there in the intima. It looks like this um, separation of the intima from the from the media of the yeah. um, of the vessel. 
Yeah, yeah. very nice, Andrew. And yeah, this is one with, with colour on as well. Mm. So there, it, it does confirm that there is a, a dissection there. I might just point a few things out, a couple of things out on this. So what we can see here with the colour on, um, oh, am I going to be able to press play on that? Probably not now. Oh, there we go. So this is the so this is the true lumen, which tends to be the smaller lumen. And yes. then we've got these filling, these filling um, areas that are all that turbulent flow is coming out of that true lumen and filling the false lumen. Um, so these are the points of entry um, yes. into into that false lumen as well. Um, so really nasty. So this is a you know Stanford A with with extension all the way down um, to the descending. Um, can you tell what we can what we're looking at here? Um, so you have um, you've got a pulse wave Doppler, have you, through the descending aorta? Yes. Yeah. Showing um, hollow diastolic reversal. Of flow. Yeah, yeah, very nice. Um, the again, there'd probably be one of those questions where they would ask you to critique it because you could optimize this, couldn't you? It's probably not far down enough. You want to be sort of um, distal to where the left subclavian is coming off. Right. Um, all this dead space here needs to go, so you need to reduce the low pass filter um, and sort of and probably increase the gain a little bit on this one. But yeah, you can definitely see. So this is the forward flow. That blue flow forward and then this backwards uh, red flow coming back that you're just picking up there nicely um, with with pulse wave Doppler. Very nice, um, Andrew. Um, good job. And this is her toe, um, which is the. Do you do much toe in your unit? Are you? No, no, we don't have that. Um, not at this stage. Not at this. Yeah. So this is yeah. the long axis, a bit what we were showing at the beginning yeah. of the talk, through the aorta aortic root, and we can see here this awful uh, dissection flap, mm -hmm. um, and probably maybe a little bit of prolapse as well of this right coronary cusp coming through, mm -hmm. which is a little bit thickened. And again, just that. Now we can see beautifully that um, regurgitant jet. And again, just going through that structure that we were using before. So big dissection flap, obviously a horrendous 2D sort of defect. Um, big broad jet, um, hard to see a proximal flow convergence, isn't it? Because it's just so nasty looking. But if we measure the jet, you know, jet height to LVOT, um, then then that's, you know, taking up 100 percent of it. It looks really nasty and turbulent. Um, so all in keeping with with severe um, putting all the pieces of jigsaw puzzle together. This looks like to be um, the primary problem is a dissection, um, a Stanford A dissection extension all the way down to the descending with severe aortic root. Uh, root regurgitation, severe uh, aortic regurgitation. Now there's different mechanisms of uh, aortic regurgitation in dissection. You can either have that, you know, the dissection just um, making your aortic root really big and so you get a coaptation defect, or you can get um, prolapse of one of your leaflets. Um, you can get flail of one of your leaflets, or you can actually get the intimal tissue sort of hanging down leading to a coaptation defect as well. So you'd need to to look through that in a more detail to describe the exact mechanism. But the key thing is, you know, not missing the dissection, spotting the severe AR um, and sort of going from there in terms of management. Um, fine. Does anyone want to do this case? This is quite a nice one. It's very short. There's only a couple of loops. Um, any volunteers for this one? I think there's four loops or something. I can give it a go. Yeah, go for it. Um, so 52-year-old male with a fever and cardiogenic shock who's intubated and the transthoracic stone query of vegetation and then he's on 20 mils an hour of, I assume that means single strength noradrenaline. Sorry, that's bad, yes. Um, the first... That's OK. Uh, the first image on the left is a sort of mid-esophageal short axis view on transesophageal echo of the aortic valve um, and so I can see that the just looking at the aortic valve whether it's in this left image whether it is tri-leaflet I think it is um, 
and it appears like there's some thickening or um, echo density at least around the um, around the coaptation points of the leaflet. And when you slow the image down, yeah, there may be a mass on on the non coronary cusp. Uh, looking at the right sided image, which is the same with uh, color Doppler. It appears like there's some. There's aortic regurgitation. And I'll just slow the image down, but it appears to be also coming. Uh, yeah, so sort of more towards that non coronary cusp. Uh, so this is the metesophageal long axis view, um, focusing on the aortic valve. Again, looks like the sort of coaptation points of the leaflets are thickened. You get the impression that there may be a mass attached to those leaflets, um, and they're possibly flailing. Um, but then there's certainly a large central regurgitant jet on the color Doppler imaging. I can see now that it says he's had a history of bicuspid aortic valve. <laughs> um, um, so this is the descending thoracic aorta, um, and you can see that there's uh, diastolic flow reversals through, through the whole cycle, um, and that and diastolic velocity again is probably more than 0.2 meters per second or at about 0.2 meters per second. Yeah, so uh, that would be if you have to summarize this in a sentence for me, Rob, like putting it together in a, as a conclusion, how would, how would you say that? How would so you do that? the conclusion is, so I conclude that he looks, he, this bicuspid aortic valve to have severe aortic regurgitation Vegetation and with the history um, and the risk factor of having a bicuspid aortic valve, I'd be concerned for a vegetation contributing to that. Um, yeah, very, very nice. And, uh, if that's my conclusion, then my next steps would be um, ensuring that he's had antibiotics and referring to my cardiothoracic colleagues for consideration of um, valve replacement. Yeah, very nice, Rob. He's actually, um, he also was in complete heart block, this guy, which is a bit mean of me to show, but yeah, you can see, probably see a little bit from the ECG, but, um, and the key thing I was Not just it. showing you, you were, you were, your suspicion was right. I think you were, you were thinking is that bicuspid initially, because remember at the beginning I was saying how the, you know, the aortic valve, it's usually, and you do need to slow it down and it's the mid systolic frame that's really going to help you. So if you're not seeing that beautiful triangular shape in mid systole, um, yeah. then, you know, and it's elliptical. Um, yeah, you've got to be suspicious for bicuspid. And this is the fused raffi um, here. That's all calcified. That fused yeah. fused raffi is calcified. And we're getting a highly eccentric sort of almost splay of, you know, in the short axis. So it doesn't look that bad, I would say, in the short axis, which is the importance of interrogating these things in multiple planes. And I've only shown you a few loops here. Um, and, you know, obviously we can then see this, you know, thickening um, of the leaflet of the cusps and um, yeah, a, an echogenic independently mobile mass that is flailing into the LVOT in this circumstance, highly suspicious for a vegetation um, with what looks to be because putting the key thing for this is remember the upstream and downstream consequences. So looking, um, you know, sort of downstream at the aorta, we've got holosystolic flow reversal, we've got a really eccentric kind of jet, so we can't fully see flow convergence. Remember I, we mentioned about the bicuspid valve, sometimes make it tricky for you to see that lovely vena contractor just because of how mm. it's um, co-opting and everything which is why we're not seeing that but we are seeing a, a broad jet you know um, 
proximal to the to the valve um so that it's sort of almost like that momentum's happening you know sort of after the after the fact and that's why putting the things together with what's happening in the aorta um getting a close look at what's happening with the um with the valve itself is really important here and obviously looking back at old echoes and things like that will be helpful um because this is acute on chronic decompensation for this man um obviously his risk factor for infective endocarditis was the bicuspid valve what other things out of interest rob would you be looking for in this man with the bicuspid aortic valve, particularly if you are calling the surgeons about him or the cardiologist? Cardiolog yeah, I guess we sort of mentioned it earlier, but with bicuspid aortic valve, you've got increased risk of the Yeah, sorry, you're just cutting out there, but absolutely, you know, aortopathy, so measuring the aortic route really carefully is important. Um, has important management implication and yeah, make sure that you're not missing a, a coarctation as well, which is quite rare. Um, if they've got a coarct, I think 50% have a bicuspid valve, but if there's a bicuspid only, I want to say 1% or somewhere between 1 and 5, don't quote me on that, but um, have also have a coarctation. Um, so yeah, important to look at the aorta in these guys as well. Very nice. I might just brief, I go through these as well. This, these are Chris's cases. I don't know them in detail, but again, just describing what we can see. Um, a really dilated aortic valve. I'll just put my laser pointer on. Um, it's a small LV, probably a bit hypertrophied, reasonable systolic function, but the obvious abnormality is this huge, um, di usually dilated aortic root with a linear um, mobile structure, which is highly suspicious for a dissection flap. Um, I also note the anterior um, anterior echo free space, which in this context I'm thinking is a hemopericardium, um, and there is also at least you know, it's difficult to say in this one view, but some um, significant aortic regurgitation. I'd like to further interrogate, interrogate all of this. Um, so, yeah, this is one that you can see there. Again, this one is um, I've stolen from Case and it's a, um, a you can see hugely dilated aortic root. That's the, the obvious thing that jumps out to us there. Um, and putting colour on this, we can see um, that the uh, there's a, a very broad uh, turbulent uh, regurgitant jet, um, which is you know without doing any measurements on it's um, highly suspicious for um, severe aortic regurgitation. But absolutely need to look at more things with that. Um, this is again one of Chris's cases. It's a young patient with a large vessel vasculitis, a tachycardias, I think. Um, again, what we are seeing is. Um, maybe a mildly dilated LV with imp certainly impaired basal function of the antraceptum at least, and overall, you know, um, an impaired left ventricle with a dilated aortic root and maybe thickening and restricted motion of the leaflets as well, but it's difficult to say. Um, and what we can see with colour is that there is um, significant aortic regurgitation. There seems to be two jets. Um, there's a flow convergence. I'd like to do ABC, vena contracted, jet width, um, look at the upstream and downstream effects in the aorta, um, because this is highly suspicious for at least moderate, if not severe, um, aortic regurg. And there's uh, multiple jets, so definitely needs more um, interrogation. And she's also got this dilated um, aortic uh, proximal, proximal aorta as well, aortic arch. So um, again, just describing the mechanism. So here, is a patient with mobile echogenicities on the mitral and aortic valve leaflets, um, which uh, are suspicious for vegetation, could also be thrombus or tumour. Um, and with the colour applied over the aortic valve, I can see there is highly turbulent um, eccentric jet, um, which in this context looks highly suspicious for a severe associated aortic regurg. I would like to quantitate this more with um, further views, off-axis imaging, pulse wave Doppler, continuous wave Doppler, look at the upstream and downstream effects, looking for diastolic flow reversal in the aorta. Um, I'm going to skip through this because you you already all know this. Um, I was going to go through some special circumstances, but we've completely run out of time. We'll do prosthetic valves another time. Obviously, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's really important to spot these patients because, you know, putting in things like balloon pumps can be very harmful. Um, and obviously, if we're making decisions about other devices, you know, mild AR maybe isn't a massive contraindication, but often when we put 
things like beer, well, impellers and stuff, we can make that a lot worse. Um, and obviously then, you know, the the uh, LV can, um, you know, you know, you essentially it'll need unloading. Uh, otherwise, you're running to run into lots of problems with with filling pressures and and what have you. Um, putting these into patients with severe AR, same for LVADs and things. Um, so we absolutely need to recognise these. It will come up in your exam. Things that we do normally in the ICU will worsen aortic regurgitation. Um, so we we need to pick it up early. Um, like all valve. Problems. You'll hear this a lot, seeing the whole heart, you know, what's the impact on the left sided structures? We didn't talk about it, but, you know, you leave these guys long enough, you know, with stenosis of their or regurgitation of their aortic valves, high left atrial pressures, that's going to have a downstream, a, a, an upstream effect on your um, RV and pulmonary circulation, isn't it, when it's really end stage? Um, and key to, to not miss that, especially in the critically ill where um, integration of the hemodynamics and consequences is, is really important. Be systematic. You can definitely get this wrong. Never hang your hat on one thing. Remember all of these things that we're looking at with 2D colour, pulse wave and continuous wave Doppler, colour M mode. Um, you know, they're really designed for the more stable chronic AR population. And you just need to be really astute um, with your integration into the clinical picture when we've got patients with acute AR um, and, you know, never hang your hat, as I say, on a single thing and try to be quite disciplined when you're going through your structure and assessment. Um, sometimes, you know, we're not going to make things better just with medical management and we need to, that's why mechanism, mechanism, mechanism is so important because if you're trying to treat someone you know, with with diuretics and and keeping you know keeping their heart rate up, keeping them sort of um, fast and loose. Um, you know, you're not going to make them get them better. Um, you know, if they've got a big a perforated leaflet or a big prolapse leaflet or something. So mechanism is key. Uh, remember the inextricable linkage of the valve leaflets with the aortic root. You need to assess both of them together, and and talk about mechanism and severity. Never, you can never talk about severity without mentioning mechanism. Um, and I think that's all I have to say. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, that's a, I've gone over again, which is very usual for me. <laughs> um, but I hope you all learn one or two things and um, yeah, got something out of going through the cases, which can be a little bit scary, I think. And we might end it end it there. Thank you all very much. If you learnt something, hit like and subscribe to our channel for more videos uploaded weekly. For bite-sized versions, follow us on Twitter at Echo Nepean and check out the tutorials. Or head over to our websites for the latest hands-on courses. Links in the channel banner. And thanks, thanks for, for watching. watching.